Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Our guest tonight is Kamal Bawa, Distinguished Professor of Conservation Biology at UMass Boston and founder of the famous Conservation Institute, Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, ATRI, in Bangalore, India. Professor Bawa grew up in India. Soon after receiving his PhD at Punjab University, he became a research fellow at Harvard, then joined the biology faculty at UMass Boston in 1974. He served as chair of that department from 1989 to 1992, and in 1996 received the special title Distinguished Professor of Biology, and in the same year he established ATRI. Dr. Bawa has a very long list of awards and distinctions, some of which we've listed on the page for this event on the Science for the Public website. These include Distinguished Research Fellowships at Harvard, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the UMass Chancellor's Award for Distinction in Service. He is also a fellow of numerous pr uh, prestigious uh, societies and has served as counselor or president of major organizations for biology and conservation. Dr. Bawa is the author of many professional papers, textbooks, and monographs on tropical biology. And with the famous nature photographer Sandesh Kadur, he has produced two award-winning books on the Himalayas, which he'll describe for us tonight. Both books have been cited particularly for the brilliant combination of photographs and texts that bring the unique region of the Himalayas to the world and the general public. A major focus of our discussion tonight, however, is the acclaimed ATRI conservation and the research, the research center founded by Dr. Bawa in ba Bangalore. This institute has introduced an innovative approach to conservation, education, and social justice. Dr. Bawa will talk about the urgent need to preserve tropical hotspot regions and his innovative strategies for training both researchers and the general public in conservation. We are very honored to have this international hero to help us understand both the need to preserve tropical ecosystems and the ways in which communities can contribute to such efforts. Welcome, Dr. Bawa. Thank you. I'd like to start by asking you uh, what tropical hotspots or hotspots are to begin with these uh, biodiversity hotspots. Tropical hotspots are areas of the world in which there is a very high number of species, unusual richness of life. Mm -hmm. There are about 34 hotspots of biodiversity identified all over the world. One of those hotspots is actually in the US, in California, and as I mentioned, there are 33 other hotspots throughout the world. Very large number of plant and animal species. Another distinguishing feature of hotspots is that the rate of degradation is very high in these hotspots. Mm. And so two characteristics, the number of species and the rate of degradation define a hotspot. Oh, I see. So it's not just the life, but the threat to the life right, at, this, at right. this time. One a positive feature and yes, another and one a negative feature. Yes, and a very feature. negative feature, and therefore yes. hot for that purpose. Then you and uh, Sandesh Sador have taken on a project to develop a couple of outstanding books that have gotten a lot of praise um, on the 
several hot spots mm -hmm. in India, correct? Can you tell us about those hot spots and about the book projects? India's landmass covers four hot spots of biodiversity. One is along the western coast of India mm -hmm. called the Western Ghats. The other, of course, is the famous Himalaya. The third one is the Indo-Malayan region mm. at the border between India and Myanmar mm. or Burma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the fourth one is a series of islands in the Bay of Bengal mm -hmm. called Andaman and Nicobar Island. The southern group of these islands is a part of the hotspot that covers Indonesia. The two major hotspots are, of course, the Western Ghats and the Himalayas. Okay, so these are quite, they're very interesting in all sorts of communities, the life, the flora, the fauna, and the human communities there too, I guess. But when you set about to make these fabulous books, these uh, gorgeous photography uh, books with uh, text, what was your purpose in doing this? Because you've done so much scholarly work. Right. I think one of the motivation was uh, to bring to life uh, really this tremendous amount of richness of life to general public. Of course, there is a danger when you do this sort of thing by means of coffee table books, mm -hmm. because coffee table books are expensive. Mm -hmm. India is a poor country. But nevertheless, by these books, you can reach the libraries, you can reach the private sector. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you can reach the policy makers and decision makers. Mm -hmm. And people in India, when they see these books, they are really very surprised to see that all this unusual plants and animals are all around them. Mm -hmm. Western Ghats, for example, is literally the backyard of the city of Mumbai, oh, a very goodness. large city. Yes. And technically, the Western Ghats area includes the city of Mumbai. That's very hard to imagine. <laughs> Yet people of Mumbai have no idea yeah. that there is so much diversity all around it. Yeah. So when people of Mumbai see these books, they find it very hard to believe that they can travel a few kilometers and enjoy all this diversity of life. And of course, the books received a lot of attention from the Prime Minister of India and from the President of India. And uh, I have an interesting incident <laughs> uh, to, to, to report. In a way, uh, once I met Minister of Environment and Forests of India. And he said, oh, Dr. Baba, I was reading your book on the Western Ghats last night. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, I have a conference to address in the morning. <laughs> and so I think the book summarizes what is known about the biodiversity <laughs> there, so it's very convenient. And I was, of course, pleased to hear that. Yeah. But when I said that he was reading it last night, I wondered, you know, why he was doing it. By, because my book is not, I didn't think, uh, was supposed to cure insomnia. Yeah, but, oh, no, uh, not uh, at all. Not and, at all uh, there. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think any time you have such people taking interest in mm -hmm. the work, you know, then, then you feel that you're reaching uh, the decision makers. Right, and as they are uh, made more available in library systems and so forth <clears throat> here as well, then people see an area that they had no idea was uh, so incredibly beautiful. But then the, these are 
very, in a sense, uh, fragile ecosystems, I take it. What, what's happening to these, because that was a motivation, evidently, for writing the books as well. What's happening to these exquisite ecosystems? As I mentioned earlier, biodiversity hotspots are defined on the basis of rates of degradation. Mm -hmm. uh, in these parts of the world, of, of the world, the loss of natural habitat is occurring at a very, very high rate. Mm -hmm. There are many factors responsible mm -hmm. for that. Population, mm -hmm. uh, population expansion, <coughs> land use change, land use change caused by development, mm -hmm. uh, by conversion of land for agriculture and for other purposes, uh, for hum human use. So there is a wide variety of factors, and we don't understand these factors mm. fully. Uh, we know uh, that there are three or four factors uh, in a given area might be responsible for that. What, what is the relative contribution of each factor? I think it's hard to uh, study. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can, but there is very little work in that area. And some of the projects include things like the hydroelectric dams. Is that true that, the, that these seem uh, large-scale farming and, and so on? And we're not <laughs> terribly aware of that here. We're aware of it in the United States and to some extent South America, but not in that region, which we think of as more pristine. But Yes, construction of hydroelectric dams, uh, I think, uh, is one of the examples of mm -hmm. how development of infrastructure can cause damage to the environment. In the case of Himalaya, there is really a very heavy spree of dam construction. Both India and China mm -hmm. are growing at a very fast rate. The rate of economic growth in both countries uh, during the last two decades have averaged very, very close to eight to nine percent. And so there are huge demands for energy in both countries. And as a result, uh, they are both trying to tap the waters of the rivers mm -hmm. flowing out of the Himalaya. I think we have to keep in mind that Himalaya is the source of eight largest rivers of Asia. So there's a lot of water. There are approximately 400 dams being constructed on the Indian side of the Himalaya mm. and another 400 dams on the other side in China. And of course we all require energy. I think what is happening with the dam construction is that there is no proper environment impact assessment. Mm. Secondly, even if one has to construct the dams, there is a lot of things we can do in terms of preventing ancillary damage. Mm. It's not only the construction of the dam. Construction of the dams requires labor. Mm -hmm. It requires construction of roads. Mm. And so you have not only the area covered by the dams, but also all the roads that are leading. Right. And how much care you take. There are various ways of constructing roads. Uh, there are various regulations that need to be met. Very often the regulatory regime is not fully functional right. in both the countries right. and there are landslides and so and so and so forth and finally let me say is, uh, something about the labor required to build mm -hmm. the dams mm -hmm. there are places where population small remote places in the himalaya where population has quadrupled because of in the just a matter labor. of two years, three years, because of all the labor that has been brought mm -hmm. in to build the dams. Mm -hmm. And they put tremendous pressure on natural resources and so on and so forth. 
So there are a wide variety of ways in which such damage can be minimized even if one has to construct the dams. Right, but it seems to be ignored for the most part right. as a worldwide problem, right. as a matter of fact, uh, with that push for energy. Could I step back for a moment to just ask about that, that diversity that's being threatened by all of this uh, uh, intrusion? Um, for th you, for people like you who are concerned to get this on record before it's all gone, then are how do you see this ability of these species to adapt, even though they have a great variety among themselves? Can they adapt fast enough? The process of adaptation is is somewhat slow. Uh, you know, evolution generally occurs at, right. a, at, yeah. a, at a slow rate. Right. Uh, the changes are very, uh, uh, the changes are occurring at a very fast rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is not only that the environmental conditions are changing, but also when the habitat disappears, a number of populations are lost. So populations become smaller in size. Yeah. And there, even one, if one is able to adapt, by the time adaptation occurs, the number would be reduced to just a few individuals right. that their survival will be, will be uh, questionable. Right. Uh, the other thing that's happening in that region as well as elsewhere in the world is the climate change in general. And I wonder how that has affected temperature changes or, 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 you know, rain cycles and so on. How is that affecting these two areas like the guts? The two guts? Uh, not so much in the guts, not to say that the climate change is not significant there, mm -hmm. uh, but it has not been very well examined. But for the Himalayas, I think we have a lot of data on the magnitude of the climate change. I shouldn't say a lot of data, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. comparatively speaking, more data than we have for the Western Ghats. Also, uh, in the Himalaya, you have a lot of glaciers. Yeah. Uh, Himalaya is, as you know, also known as the third pole. Yeah. Because of the amounts of ice locked up in the Himalayan glaciers. Right. See, we know that those glaciers are melting at a fast rate. Yeah. Uh, the rate is very variable. Uh, in the Western Himalaya, they are not melting at such a, at, at that much of a faster rate as they are in the Eastern Himalaya. Mm -hmm. The temperature is increasing uh, our own work shows that the temperature in the Himalaya has increased by 1.5 degree centigrade uh, during the period which we studied was from mid 1980s to mid 2000s and it's sort of a 20 year period right right and that is three times mm. more increase than the global average and the rainfall has become erratic and all this is likely to change the hydrology of the rivers. Right. And that is one thing when people planned these construction of these dams, they didn't take into account the changes in the hydrology due to climate change. So this is a big problem because now you have, I guess, a species that can't get up and move or change or get air conditioning or whatever it is that they need for adaptation. So it uh, sort of magnifies the threat. Is uh, th that, that is right. I, I think in many parts of the Himalaya, I have seen uh, the rivers as we know them, they have ceased to flow mm -hmm. because a series of dams have been construct constructed. And this, again, is likely to have just a huge impact on the aquatic biodiversity.
Okay. Uh, you can imagine this accelerating, you know, so it seems as though there are many areas of the world where conservation biologists are having trouble just, just keeping up with it. They can't really predict very well uh, because of this acceleration, which is hard to predict. And you're, uh, do you find yeah. this too? Do you? That, that, that is true. I think we've, we face many challenges. One is uh, the number of people who study conservation biology yeah. is relatively small. Secondly, we have not fully documented this biodiversity. Yeah. <laughs> Thirdly, uh, this biodiversity is being lost at a, at a very rapid right. rate. Right. Uh, certainly at the habitat level, the ecosystems are getting transformed. The ecosystems are disappearing. Understanding the drivers of change is a complex issue. So we are not able to keep pace with all that is happening. Right. And, 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 and the amount of knowledge we really need to collect, uh, we are not able to together. Now, you set up a tree, evidently not necessarily anticipating this particular situation, right. but that is quite a unique um, uh, institute. And I wonder if you could tell us about that. One of the things that I would like to talk about is this uh, innovative approach to training of the scientists and doing the work and also training a community, apparently. Well, anyway, tell us about ATRI and how it functions. Okay, um, that's a very Big subject, I know. <laughs> Big subject, and I think your question, let me break your question into smaller uh, uh, components. First of all, ATRI stands for Ashoka yeah. Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. Acronym is ATRI. I set up ATRI because I felt uh, that not only in India, but mm -hmm. throughout the world, our approach to biodiversity loss was somewhat, uh, somewhat naive. Uh, there are a bunch of biologists who are trying to understand uh, uh, the distribution of biodiversity and then what is driving the loss of biodiversity. Uh, the loss of biodiversity, the factors that are responsible for, for disappearance of biodiversity are complex. And they are primarily uh, social and economic. So I felt, uh, along with, of course, many others at that time, that we require an interdisciplinary approach to the issue of biodiversity loss. That we have to not only look at the ecological dimensions of decline in biodiversity, but also social, human, and political dimensions of this loss mm -hmm. of biodiversity mm -hmm. and the consequences of this loss of, uh, to uh, human societies. It was mid-90s. Uh, and uh, I was working with a group of people uh, who were from different disciplines in one particular area of south southern India. Uh, there was an e sort of an economist uh, and uh, who was also a very good social scientist or, or had a un good understanding of political processes mm -hmm. too. And then I, I was working with a person who had a background in banking and oh, he had helps. a good, good <laughs> sense of business and also economics. And uh, so we developed a very interdisciplinary project mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Biligari Rangan Hills of the Western Guards to look at the use of forest resources by local communities and how at the same time we can enhance the rural income of this particular group and also conserve biological diversity or sustainably uh, or, or develop a mechanism that will lead to the sustainable use of the resources mm -hmm. they were taking mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the forest. 
So basically that was the beginning of an interdisciplinary approach to a very complex problem on my part. And then I also felt that in order to make progress, you cannot work on a project-wide basis. You have to create an institution. Mm -hmm. And I decided to have this, uh, uh, you know, establish this Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment Oratory, a very interdisciplinary center. And, uh, and so we are taking a very interdisciplinary disciplinary approach to the problems. And, and what do you do in that center then? I mean, it's, do you train scientists and, well, well tell, what do you okay. do in there? We, first of all, first and foremost, we generate new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge that can be applied right away to some of the pressing problems we face. Second, we want to ensure that the knowledge we are generating has an immediate impact. It can have an impact on the policy makers or it can have an impact on the ground at the grassroots level, on the communities mm -hmm. uh, of the areas where we are working. So one of the unique features we have is that we try to bridge the gap between knowledge and policy making on one side, but also between knowledge and action on the ground on the other side. And also bridge the gap between policy makers and the local communities in which we are working. You mentioned the local communities, which is one of the interesting things, and I'm not sure that uh, viewers will be familiar with the local communities, but I understand uh, that there are communities that go back, I don't know, hundreds of years and so on, correct? Right. And you have many, you have diversity of communities as well. Um, they must be under threat in the same way that the biodiversity, the ecosystems are uh, as well. Um, what can you do for those communities to, you're attempting to preserve them too and to engage them in preserving the biodiversity. Is that the idea? Yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, in these two books you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, uh, I think one of the unusual features of these books is that they are not only about different types of plants and animals, but also different indigenous groups mm -hmm. that inhabit the area. And uh, we know that richness of biodiversity is very much correlated with, at least in case of India and other parts of the world too, with ethnic and cultural mm -hmm. diversity. Mm -hmm. So these indigenous groups, uh, both in the Western Ghats and the Eastern Himalayas, have remained somewhat isolated, not completely, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they have remained somewhat isolated and have managed to preserve or conserve their cultures, their traditional practices, and so on and so forth. And I think this is what you are referring to. With the biodiversity loss, uh, we are likely to lose a lot of our cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. It is well known, for example, many of the languages in many parts of the world uh, that are rich in biodiversity have been lost. Mm -hmm. And that has happened in India too. Mm -hmm. So what can one do? I think that is one of the major challenges uh, the conservation biologists face uh, because the, our traditional approach has been to declare an area which becomes a protected area, a national park yeah, yeah. or a reserve, and then we don't know very much you know, as to what to do with people who have been living there. And uh, so uh, the approach we are trying to follow, and it's difficult, it's not an easy task, to see how we can integrate concerns of the people with the concerns of the environment, uh, 
can be simultaneously conserve these cultures as well as biodiversity and, uh, and again there are a wide, wide variety of ways where possibly one can do that. But the first and foremost is for the people to have power mm -hmm. uh, over their fate. Mm -hmm. I think some of that power has been lost mm. uh, and uh, as, as we all know to some extent political power comes from economic power mm -hmm. and these people are very poor. Yeah. And uh, there are there is the issue of social justice you mentioned earlier, yeah. rights issue, rights over land, because many of the areas that have not become protected areas were their original lands, native lands, yeah. and how to bring some some sort of balance where they have their rights, where we are able to conserve biodiversity as well as we are able to make people's lives better. So that's one of the objectives of ATRI is to try to I wouldn't say that engage these people or protect them too or Yeah, I would say one of the objectives. Mm -hmm. One oh, of the I understand. Objective, right. One right. of the objectives right. is to, to work with the indigenous people, uh, to work with the forest dwellers as 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 there's another phrase we can use. Uh, to see how through economic power or by realization of the exercise of their rights, things can be improved. Uh, Do you uh, have a way of training uh, the uh, environmental scientists as well, conservation scientists, uh, through this organization? Yes, uh, ATRI has a very vibrant doctoral program. Yes. And doctoral program is, uh, is one of its kind especially in, in Asia, it's very interdisciplinary mm -hmm. and it's a program in conservation and sustainability science. And uh, we currently have about 43 uh, students enrolled in this doctoral program. The degree is given by Manipal University, mm -hmm. but all the recruitment of the students and their training and the coursework uh, that is all designed by the faculty of ATRI. That, it seems to me, is one of the best aspects of the whole organization. It's very appealing. Now it's becoming uh, more common, perhaps, the, to give people uh, cross-disciplinary training, much more comprehensive training, field, a lot more field training, and so on. But it seems to me you were way ahead of the, of the game when you got this started. Um, are people doing this sort of thing, the, developing the, this mode of training people now in your field? There are challenges. Uh, I think, uh, and, and we are facing those challenges too in our sure. faculty. And uh, <coughs> as you know, some of those challenges we also discussed at our talk at Harvard yeah. uh, a week ago. Uh, but we are making progress. Mm -hmm. And I think what is encouraging is, is the attitude taken by the young generation. Mm -hmm. they, want, they don't want to be disciplinary oriented. You know, they want to address complex problems. Mm -hmm. They want to take, up, take these challenges. And this is very encouraging. And if one were to look at the problems ATRI doctoral students are addressing, mm -hmm. one sees how well they are in integrating you know, either the human or policy concerns with very high quality natural science. Right, it's a very interesting way to go. Right. Um, I noticed that you have a kind of special course. Is that a spin-off from the ATRI mentality? Yeah. I think this semester we are offering for the first time this course in sustainability science. Mm -hmm. Uh, which uh, really addresses the complex issue of uh, uh, associated with sustainable environment, what is sustainability science, and uh, how we can bring together natural and social sciences to bear upon uh, some of the complex challenges we are facing in the field of environment uh, and uh, issue of justice, issue of equity, 
and so on and so forth. The course is going very well. Uh, we I'm are having sure. a very good time. Yes. Right. Uh, it just, this is like a new direction for training people in this field now, and much more comprehensive. Um, do you, and I close with this, but do you foresee uh, uh, an interest in training the public, in opening this sort of thing to the public of addressing these very complex uh, issues in some way that would be accessible to the general public? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, in case of Eatry, we have uh, a lot of interest in developing a sort of a citizen science program. Yes. And I think citizen science program, we have had discussions here too. Yes. Uh, in the university, and I think there is a tremendous interest in those types of programs. Right. Uh, and I'm hoping you'll sort of develop one. I think that it's a wonderful area, a, a field, that uh, it sort of invites citizen science, but right. it also gives us, in the non-experts, an opportunity just to appreciate complexity and to learn how to analyze things in a, in a rather different way. And uh, so I'm hoping that we'll do more of that. You will do more <laughs> of that. You have been a great innovator and uh, it's, it, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk with you about it. We really appreciate your coming by and telling us uh, about your work and I wish you all the luck in the world with it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.